Ephesians 5, 8 through 14 says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you.
you coming and being part of this occasion we worship the Lord Jesus. Before we go into our announcements, I uh, want to, uh, obviously yesterday was Veterans Day. I think it's appropriate for us to recognize and say uh, our appreciation to our veterans. So if you have served in the armed forces in any way, would you stand and let us recognize you today? in our bulletin this morning, church family. We see a lot of theme this week is donation of winter clothes uh, to Mexico. And then you also see that uh, this is the Saturday that we go down and serve at Kiro House. If you are interested in doing that, you can speak to Bob or Chuck about that and take part in the breakfast that, they, that we serve down there. And also today, hopefully, you've been able to bring back your uh, Christmas child shoe boxes. Uh, we need those today. Uh, technically, do they have till Wednesday, Renee? That's the last day of the job. Very last day. For you or for them? I can write them up Wednesday afternoon if somebody lets me know they're doing that. Okay. I can't have nobody else getting the 15th for the people doing that. Okay, so if you haven't got yours in yet and you still plan on it, can you get in contact with Renee so she'll know? Uh, hopefully, we've gotten most of those turned back in. Um, before we go on, let me talk to you a bit. Last week uh, was the horrific shooting at Southern Springs, Texas, First Baptist Church there. And I know uh, many of our hearts have been grieved this week hearing about those 26 innocent lives taken and the others injured. Um, we have had some security measures here, and we're going to continue to look at those. This was a a small rural church, uh, so we recognize some similarities there. Um, for your comfort, uh, I haven't seen Ernie this morning. I assume the reason I haven't seen Ernie is because he's outside. True. Uh, Ernie is an Arizona Ranger and uh, has experience in law enforcement, as do uh, several people in our congregation. So we're going to, uh, through our leadership and through others, uh, continue to have these conversations about protecting our church. So um, none of them obviously will be perfect, and we want to avoid a couple of extremes. One extreme we want to avoid is it can't happen here, we all love each other, so we're not going to do anything. The other extreme we want to avoid is everybody with their hand on the trigger and patting down visitors who are coming to worship. Okay, so somewhere in there we want to get to the point where, yes, we have security uh, measures in place, we have a plan, and if we have people out of the parking lot, the visitors will view them more as greeters than uh, as a security team. So I know we have many conversations that need to be had in the future, and we're going to continue to have those uh, but I did want to address that topic today because it is important to us. And we're going to pray in just a minute, and we will certainly pray for that church uh, in Texas that's going through so much heartache. Okay, um, foster care Christmas project. Um, hopefully you've uh, got your ornament and are shopping. Bring those back uh, by December 3rd, if you will. And yesterday was Veterans Day, but today is... Uh, I can't remember the exact title of it, something like National Adoption Day in churches. So what I'd like for us to do is recognize, kind of like we did better, we had them stand just a minute ago, I'd like for all those families that have been directly impacted by adoption to stand and let us appreciate them as well. If you've been directly impacted by adoption in your family, would you all stand and let us see you? that's indirectly impacted by adoption and family sustain. And that's all of us in the church family because we have these wonderful folks in our church who have adopted and it's such a beautiful picture of the gospel because we are all adopted in Christ when we come to follow Him. So let's all stand together just in unity as we think about it.
All right, you can be seated now. Thank you very much. All right, so along with our uh, recognizing our Veterans on Veterans Day, uh, Dee has been taking up um, a collection to send to our deployed military men, and specifically uh, one from our congregation. She plans on sending one of those tomorrow. So that doesn't mean stop bringing them. It means keep doing it because she's going to send packages regularly. We appreciate this project. Um, so we're going to have a special call business meeting after church today. Uh, I'd like for us, we've been announcing uh, Jeremy and his nomination for deacon service. I'd also invite you to look at a Centennial Vision Covenant. Uh, it should be in all of your bulletins. This is an initiative um, by our executive director, David Johnson, who came here and preached this past April uh, from several years ago. Uh, and it's, it's basically saying we want more people to come to Jesus in southern Arizona. We want to plant churches. We want to see people baptized. Uh, I've been serving on the convention council for our state for three years. Our church would be serving. I've been asked to serve another term. It would really look a lot better if our church was actually a vision, Centennial Vision Church. Uh, so I would like for us to talk about that today at our business meeting as well. But I've got that in here for you to take a look at as we move into our business meeting. I am excited to bring Jeremy before you for our nomination for deacon service. Uh, you have hopefully looked at the qualifications that are listed in 1 Timothy 3. That's our first, that, that's our guideline, and I believe you'll see that Jeremy meets those qualifications, and we have, it says in there, let them be tested. We have had a three-month examination process with Jeremy, and he has done tremendously well through that. So, I would also like to encourage you, um, I think pastors should lead, and I want to assure you that I have pastors should not dictate, they should not rule, but they should lead the church. And I have spent much time in prayer and seeking God's face the last six months or so and fully believe that God has led us to Jeremy at this time. I'm not saying we don't continue to look for folks to serve in leadership, but I believe God has led us to him at this point. And uh, along with our uh, Bob and Greg currently serving as deacons, I think as we went through this examination process, Bob's comment to me was, the sooner the better uh, in terms of getting Jeremy uh, before our church for the vote. And Greg, I think, said, hey, we, we need him. We need him. So uh, it is with the full endorsement of our pastor and our current deacon body that we bring Jeremy before you today to vote on him for deacon service. Okay, last announcement. We've had a lot of announcements uh, this morning. Luminary Nights coming up December 1st and 2nd. Got a great location right in front of the rug shop over there. Uh, hopefully we can uh, have the kids sing some songs. We'll sing some songs. Have a short gospel presentation a minute or two and hand out a lot of tracks over there. We're going to meet on November 26th after church to finalize our details about this project. If you have ideas... Uh, if you want to run with some, please come and talk to me and let me know. Um, but I think this will be a great way for us to share the good news of Christ. Okay, well let's uh, take up our offering this morning. I'm going to read four verses out of Psalm, one thir uh, yeah, excuse me, Psalm 37 for us to pray through. Psalm 37 verses 1 through 4. And I was thinking of this uh, in many ways with the tragedy of First Baptist Church. Sutherland Springs. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Father, we come to you and and we love you, we praise you, we express that you are worthy of worship, and we should come to your presence just awed by who you are. And we should also be heartbroken for the wickedness that we see in our world. And we grieve alongside First Baptist Church of Sutherland Springs, Texas, 
not knowing any of them personally, but being deeply connected to them because we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And we pray for the family members of those 26 people who were killed last Sunday. We pray for your comfort, for your help to them in their grief. We pray for the pastor who lost his 14-year-old daughter and was away on that day. We pray for those who were wounded and still recovering physically. We ask your healing upon them. And so, Father, we pray for this church, and we pray for all churches that are meeting today. We pray for safety. We pray for wisdom for us as a church as we go forward, thinking through our security plans and details, Lord, that, that we would be wise and have the right measures in place. And we pray, Lord, we praise you, Father, that wickedness cannot stop the gospel that churches are still gathering today, that we do not cower in fear, that we do not cease meeting because of wickedness, that we stand and say it's worth coming together. The good news is worth proclaiming. The God of Christianity is worthy of our worship. And so we gather today in opposition to any evil or wickedness, we gather and proclaim the goodness of our God. Father, we want to thank you for our veterans who have served our country and those in our congregation who have served. Thank you for them. Bless them. Bless those who are even serving now in our church. And as they're deployed, watch over them, we pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful picture of adoption that is in our church. What a glorious thing. In a small church, we have so many wonderful adoption stories and families. So we thank you for them. We pray, Father, for homes for children for kids who need homes, for kids who don't have families. We pray, Lord, for your church to rise up and take part in this movement. Father, we pray for the ladies. We pray you bless them on the mission field. Bless their baby in the womb. Bless their family and ministry. Bless our business meeting today, we ask, Lord. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, 
not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Father, thank you for your word. Help us as your church to walk properly as in the daytime. May we throw off those works of darkness and daily, regularly put on the Lord Jesus Christ to seek to live out the holiness which we have been given solely by grace. Help us to continue to live in that grace and live a life of holiness. Help us through our examples that we give today in preaching this text to be encouraged as believers to follow the Lord Jesus wholeheartedly with undivided devotion. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Last week we preached these verses and we really started with verses 11 and 12 there. Uh, last night we were at a homeschool uh, medieval feast. And I was telling some folks who have visited with us a few times tomorrow, I'm going to be preaching about a sex-crazed pagan philosopher who makes a huge impact for Christianity. And so today you're going to see how these verses led to the conversion of this pagan and what it did in his life. But let me review for you verses 11 and 12 and say that the truths stated here, as we said last week, the truths, the realities, fueled the commands that were given. So we said those commands that are given in those verses are not free-floating, they're not just out there, they're anchored in these statements of truth. And the commands are rooted in the soon return of Jesus. So you see this in verse 11. The hour has come for you to wake from sleep. So we're told, wake up. Stop being spiritually lethargic, wake up, be alert. And then you see the grounds in the next sentence. He starts with for, and we can read that as because. So because or for, salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. So the, the coming of Christ, the full redemption of our bodies, it's closer now than we first believed, so wake up. And then verse 12 gives the ground first. The night is gone. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So that's the reality. Well, then what actions are commanded as a result? So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. So Paul is showing us that the nearness of Christ's soon return should drive us to live holy lives. And that's opposite of how this world lives. So here's the true statements in these verses. You know the time. Hour has come. Salvation is near. Night is far gone. Day is at hand. So those are the realities. And those realities undergird the commands that are given in these, in these verses. Wake up. Cast off the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light. Walk properly. Put on Christ. Make no provision for the flesh. So I hope you see that how those commands are rooted in the truths expressed. And the imagery of light, darkness, day and night is brought in here. The night is this present evil age where darkness reigns. That darkness describes the world of sin and rebellion against God. And then the day refers to the time when Jesus will return. In judgment for those who do not believe in Him, but in salvation for those who do, He'll set up His kingdom. We will be part of it. And the light refers to walking with Jesus in the midst of this dark world in which we live. So to belong to the night is to be at home in this world. To live by its principles and morality, not care about the things of God. But to belong to the day to be people of the light shows that we are not first and foremost citizens of this temporary kingdom. We are first and foremost members of the kingdom of God. And that being true, that makes living lives in this present age altogether different than members of this age live. We are to be different. We are to be salt and light, a kingdom of a priest, a peculiar people caught out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. 
So then we come to verses 13 and 14. I think what Paul is doing here is, is fleshing out what it means to wake up. In other words, verse 11 tells us to wake up, and now he's showing what that looks like. What does it mean to get rid of that spiritual sleepiness, this sleepwalking spiritually through the age in which we live? What does it mean to be alert? And you see verse 13 picks up on that metaphor of day and light and uh, darkness. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. So the word walk is often used in the New Testament. We use it in our Christianese language. You know, how's your walk with Christ? We certainly don't mean physical walk. Uh, what we mean is, what is your daily conduct like in this world as a result of having been transformed by Christ? How are you living as a member of the light in this dark world? So, to walk properly as in the daytime means that our daily living reflects that we belong to God's kingdom. And then Paul is going to contrast that. To show what the people of this age do. What does it look like to walk in darkness? And you have these uh, six descriptors. These three pairs that are given here. The first pair. Orgies and drunkenness. And those are type of things that usually occur at night. It's the unrestrained abuse of the mind and body uh, through drunkenness. And I think he's pointing this back even to verse, chapter 12, verse 2. That you now have renewed minds. Don't abuse your mind. Don't abuse your body that's being conformed to the image of Christ through this drunken state. And then the second pair that he gives describes sexual sin. Both words, sexual immorality and sensuality, are plural. To indicate to us that includes every type of sexual immorality. Fornication, sex before marriage, adultery, sex with someone outside of your spouse while you are married, homosexuality, the list goes on and on, but includes every type of illicit sexual act. And then the last pair, this quarreling and jealousy is showing a, a willingness to, to fight, a desire to get your own way, wanting selfish recognition, and this tears apart community, tears apart uh, a unity within people. So all six of those are not things that should characterize people of the life. They describe a, a, a selfishness, a, a wanting your own pleasure in life at the expense of whatever else. So we're here and we're preaching this and we're saying, who is the audience here? And like I told you last week, Paul is speaking to the church He's talking to believers. In every church, obviously, there's a mixture of believers and unbelievers. So he's talking to the church, and he's saying to us, these six sins should not characterize us. And you think, well, why does he need to say that? We still have a sin nature. So one reason I think that he says it to us is, there were many first century believers who were very immoral in terms of their lives before coming to Jesus Christ. They're involved in all kinds of sins. Hear what Paul writes to the church at Corinth. He writes to the church, 1 Corinthians 6, Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is quite a list. And then Paul will say, And such were some of you. That's who they were. They were not sweethearts. They were not nice, moral sinners. They were wretches. They were pagans. So he says that that's who you were. But secondly, that's not who you are now. Such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. 
So he's saying to us, you're changed. That's not you anymore. Don't go back to that junk. Don't go back to living how you lived before Christ as if he made no difference in your lives. You put on Christ. You're changed. You're different. So live altogether differently. So that's our theme. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put him on regularly. Put him on daily. So Paul is writing to the church. He is writing to his audience of those gathered to hear God's word. And he tells them, wake up, live for Christ in this age. And all that's true. But today I want to show you how this text, this very text, led this pagan, sex-obsessed philosopher caught up in a lifestyle, a lifestyle of sexual debauchery to leave it all to follow Jesus and make one of the greatest impacts in the history of Christianity. I would be remiss if I preached this text to you and didn't tell you how the Lord used it to bring about one of the most famous conversions in Christian history. So we're going to talk a little bit about Augustine for a while. Augustine lived from 354 to 430 AD. He lived at the time that after 800, 900 or so years of the Roman Empire ruling the world, it was in the midst of collapsing. And he has a lot to say to the world about the person of Christ in that time, in that context. So who was Augustine? Adolf uh, Harnack said he was the greatest man the church had between Paul the Apostle and Luther the Reformer. You're talking about a span of 1,500 years. Church history said after Jesus and Paul, Augustine is the most influential figure in the history of Christianity. Those are huge statements. So if you recall, when we preached about Martin Luther a few weeks ago coming up to the Reformation, we said that he was in this thunderstorm, he struck, says he'll join the monastery. Well, he becomes a monk. He becomes an Augustinian monk. So he saw himself in the line of Augustine with that uh, practice in the monastery. But once he realized justification is by faith alone, he realizes that now he's truly in the line of Augustine. So when you have Luther and Calvin in the Reformation, they are quoting Augustine all over the place. This guy who lived 1,100 years before them, they're quoting all over the place Augustine. And they see the Reformation in part... It's obviously Scripture alone is our authority, but they see the Reformation in many ways as recovering the thought of Augustine in the life of the church. Wrote two of the most famous works in Christian history, the Confessions and the City of God. But that's who he became. It's important for us to talk about who he was. So, Augustine was born to his mother, Monica, who was a devout Christian, and his father, Patricius, who was a pagan, had a bad temper and was often unfaithful to his wife. Those were his parents. But at the end of the life of Patricius, he converted to Christianity. What led him to Christ? Obviously the gospel, but the gospel preached through the quiet virtue of Monica, his wife. Here's what Augustine wrote. She worked hard to win him to you, preaching to him by her character, by which you made her beautiful, submissively lovable, and admirable to her husband. Well, in his early, early life, Augustine rejected his mother's faith. At 16, he said he walked the streets of Babylon in whose filth I rolled. Now, it's about this time that he has his famous pear tree episode. He joined friends in stealing pears from someone's orchard. But it wasn't because he was starving. He didn't care anything about eating pears. In fact, after they stole them, they threw them to pigs. Why would he steal the pears? For the pleasure of rebellion. After he was saved, he looked back about this incident. He thought about why he stole. And the real reason he stole, he said, is he loved evil. Now later on in Augustine's life, he will refute what's called the Pelagian heresy. The Pelagians basically were saying a lot of things, but one thing they said was Adam's 
fall in the garden had no effects on anybody else. They were limited to Adam. And so what they were saying was, every human being is born without original sin. Which is heresy, absolutely false according to the Bible. But the Platine were saying, there is no original sin. Augustine can look at scripture and say, no, there's original sin. But he could also look at his experience with the pear tree and say, no, no. There is original sin living in me. Hear what he said about the pear tree. I stole something which I had in plenty. The excitement of stealing and the doing of wrong, I became evil for no reason. I was foul and loved it. Folks, that's the truth of John chapter 3, verse 19. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. So just how foul was Augustine? At 17, he went to Carthage to study rhetoric. Now his mother warned him as he's leaving, don't commit fornication and don't seduce another man's wife. He said, I went to Carthage where I found myself in the midst of a hissing cauldron of lust. That's a pretty good description of who he was. It was in Carthage that he found a mistress, a woman that he lived with for 13 years, a woman that he never married, a woman with whom he had a son. So as, as we flesh out a little bit of the life of Augustine, there's two parallel tracks that I want to show you. One was his sinful obsession with sexual immorality, and two, his pursuit of philosophy. And I want to show you how those come together in his life. Augustine thought Christianity was absurd because of the problem of evil. Couldn't understand how if God is all-powerful and if God is all-good, why does evil exist? So he rebels against his mother's Christianity, but there is something in him in his life that it, it, it becomes his life's goal to search for truth, to seek wisdom. So his goal is the pursuit of truth wherever he finds it. So he looks for it in some different areas. The first philosophy he goes to is called Manichaeanism. Big word there. But it basically says there are eternal principles that are at war with each other. The philosophy said, spirit world, that's good. All the material world, that's bad. So your body is bad. So this, he felt like, gave him an out for the problem of evil. There's an evil power that makes us do evil things. But two things caused him to leave that movement. One, a friend of his dies. And Manichaeanism has nothing to say to help him out in that time. And then two, he meets one of the leaders of the movement. And he begins to ask him questions. He realizes the leader doesn't know anything about what he's talking about. He's very disappointed in the answers that this guy's give. So he leaves after nine years in Manichaeanism. He leaves it and goes to the skeptics. Now the skeptics are kind of like today's postmoderns. They're pre-postmoderns almost. They said there is no truth that can be known. So Augustine doesn't last long in a movement that says no truth can be known because his life's pursuit is to find truth, to understand truth. So he goes to Neoplatonism, which is kind of the Platonic Plato philosophy. Now this helps in some ways pave the way for him to get to Christianity because it spoke of a transcendent God. In other words, a God who is distinct from us, different from us, above us. Now, Plato and Negri, they weren't talking about the Christian God, but prior to this, he couldn't understand how the Christian God could have a spirit, could be a spirit but not have a body. But this helps him to start thinking through the, the, the reality of a transcendent God who is distinct from us. So it's about this time, as he's searching for truth, that he gets a job. Professor of Rhetoric in Milan. So he moves to Milan with Monica, his mother, with his mistress, who he never names in his writings, and with his son. Now when they get to Milan, his mom has some ideas. She thinks he needs to put away his mistress and find someone respectable, someone socially acceptable to marry. So Augustine has this huge conflict. He's going through turmoil. 
in his mind, but he finally decides to put away his mistress. And he starts to look for a socially acceptable, a respectable wife. And so he finds a woman, finds a young lady that he thinks she would be a good one to marry. So they get engaged, but she wants a two-year engagement. Now this is a problem for Augustine. Why? He's obsessed with sexual immorality. So what does he do? Finds another mistress while he waits to get married to this other woman. So sometimes, you know, you, you think of people of the past and you kind of sanctify them in their minds. Oh, they didn't have the same struggles we did. This guy is obsessed with sexual immorality. In fact, he said, I thought life too miserable unless folded in females' arms. So I want you to hear this guy's struggle. So he gets to Milan, puts away his mistress, gets engaged, finds another mistress. All this mess is going on in his life. But he's professor of rhetoric, and he hears in Milan about a guy named Ambrose, who is a great speaker. But Ambrose is a Christian pastor. So what Augustine wants to do, he wants to learn from eloquent speakers, that's his livelihood, so he wants to go hear Ambrose, whose nickname, by the way, is the Golden Throated. Now, come on, that's an awesome nickname. If you're any kind of speaker, if you get called the golden-throated, that's pretty much the highest compliment you can receive. So here's Augustine. He wants to learn from eloquent speakers. Here's this guy in this town called the golden-throated, so obviously he's got to go hear him. So he goes to hear him strictly for the style, not for the content. But guess what happens? Augustine gets more than the style. Way more than he bargained for. He gets the content of the Christian faith. He said, in Milan, I found your devoted servant, the Bishop Ambrose. At that time, and hear the metaphors, at that time his gifted tongue never tired of dispensing the richness of your corn, the joy of your oil, and the sober intoxication of your wine. Unknown to me, it was you who led me to him so that I might knowingly be led by him to you. Obviously, he's speaking to God there. So he was convinced from Platonism that God was transcendent, but how could a transcendent God above us, distinct from us, separate from us, how could this God take on human flesh? We find that in Scripture, right? And this is what Ambrose is preaching. He is preaching the Word of God. And so something starts to happen in Augustine. Remember that his life's goal is the pursuit of truth. What happens to Augustine? He comes to believe that Christianity is true. He's pursued truth. He has found it. Intellectually, he is convinced that Christianity is right. But there's a problem. Augustine would pray, God, make me chaste. In other words, God, make me abstinent. God, make me chaste. But not yet. That was his prayer. God make me chaste. But not yet. He was not ready to leave behind his sexual immorality. He loved his sin. Just like we see in the Gospels. That people love their sin. But God's not going to let him go. So it's 386. Augustine is 31 years old. His life is in turmoil. And he's talking with his best friend, Olypius, about an Egyptian monk named Anthony, who has sold all he had, given his possessions to the poor, and he's living for Christ. And he contrasts Anthony, who is free in Christ and living wholly with himself, who is just wrapped up in his own, what he calls, bestial bondage to lust. That's a good description of who Augustine was. So there's a small garden by the house where he was staying. And this troubled Augustine went out into the garden to get alone with God because his soul was so tormented. He calls it his fierce struggle, that he was overcome with violent anger with himself. He said his eyes gushed tears, he tore his hair, and he pounded his forehead with his fists. That's how deep the struggle was in this garden for Augustine. But the struggle was God working grace 
in his heart. So let me show you that he began to see that what he would gain by following Christ was far more than what he would lose. Hear from Augustine. I was held back by mere trifles. And while I stood trembling at the barrier, on the other side I could see the chaste beauty of continence or abstinence in our language. In all her serene, unsullied joy, as she modestly beckoned me to cross over and to hesitate no more. She stretched out loving hands to welcome and embrace me. I flung myself down beneath a fig tree and gave way to the tears which now streamed from my eyes. In my misery I kept crying, How long shall I go on saying tomorrow, tomorrow? Why not now? Why not make an end of my ugly sins at this moment? All at once I heard the singing, uh, the sing-song voice of a child in a nearby house. Whether it was the voice of a boy or a girl, I cannot say, but again and again I repeated, repeated the refrain, Take it and read. Take it and read. At this I looked up, thinking hard whether there was any kind of gain in which children used to chant words like these, but I could not remember ever hearing them before. I stemmed my flood of tears and stood up, telling myself that this could only be a divine command to open the book, my book of Scripture and read the first passage on which my eyes should fall. So let's pause here. The chaste beauty of continence con to me. His struggle with sin was this obsession with sexual immorality. And he could see that that was fleeting and it wasn't worth it. How long shall I go on? Tomorrow, tomorrow, why not today? So he hears this, I don't know how God sent this, but tole legi, take up and read, take up and read. So he believes this must be God directing him to go to Scripture. So he gets to Scripture. Now, I don't recommend this as a Bible reading plan to just the first passage on which your eyes fall to read that each day. I think it should be a little more systematic, but God worked in it. So here's the Christ of Augustine's soul. He's heard God directing him. He needs to go to Scripture. Let's pick up with him. So I hurried back to the place where Olympias was sitting, seized the book of Paul's epistles, and opened it. And in silence, I read the passage, uh, the first passage on which my eyes fell. Romans 13, 13, and 14. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, do you think Augustine was reading himself into those verses? Absolutely he saw that. Not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. I had no wish to read more and no need to do so, for in an instant, as I came to the end of the sentence, it was as though the light of confidence flooded into my heart and all the darkness of doubt was dispelled. And in that moment, one of the greatest minds in church history converted to Christianity. And does it not have something to say to us 1,700 or so years later? We live in an age that deifies sexual immorality. That we have these conflicts between religious liberty and sexual liberty. And it seems like in our culture, almost every time, sexual liberty wins. But we see here that that is not the path to life. Our culture could learn something from this sex-obsessed pagan philosopher who chose the joy of putting on Christ rather than the enslavement of sexual sin. The enslavement of sexual sin that promised liberty. It cannot deliver. Sin will never deliver what it promises. It will promise fulfillment and it will deliver misery. Augustine saw it. Augustine saw that leaving behind sexual immorality and gaining Christ was worth it every day and for every day throughout eternity. It would be worth it. So he becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. Soon after his mother Monica died, grateful that her son chose to follow Christ. Soon after his son died. So he's baptized by Ambrose 387 and he wants to establish something of a monastery. He wants to study the Word of God kind of like Calvin. So he goes to the city of Hippo that is bigger. They've already got a bishop there, so he's not worried about being called into service. He goes there to set up his monastery, but the church comes in and basically makes him be their pastor. And so for the rest of his life, he serves that church and serves Christian history with great writings 
for us. He left, verse 13, sexual immorality for the joy of verse 14, putting on Christ. So, what do we do? In light of this text, in light of Augustine's transformation in the gospel, we spend a lot of time talking about darkness and sin and rebellion. This text talks a lot about darkness, sin, and rebellion. But the point is not to camp out on the darkness, sin, and rebellion. The point of the darkness, sin, and rebellion is to contrast how we who have put on Christ live as members of life, live as people of the day in the midst of a dark, sinful, rebellious world. We're people of the day, so let's wake up. Let's live like it. What Paul means is if you've been woke up, if you put on Christ, don't go back to that person you used to be. Don't let the old man, that sin nature, take, it wants to rear up in you. It wants to take over. Don't allow it to. By God's grace, by the Holy Spirit, by the Word of God, live as a new creation in Jesus Christ. So we have something interesting here. We have both, we have put on Christ as a reality, as a true statement. And then we're commanded, put on Christ. So how can both of those be true? So there are some places in Scripture where to put on Christ is referring to conversion. It's that, that moment when we put off the old self and we put on Christ. Before we were in Christ, we belonged to the darkness, we walked like the darkness, but we came to Christ. Galatians 3.27 I think speaks to the conversion aspect. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's justification. That's the moment of your salvation. But here in Romans 13, what he seems to be saying, what he is saying, is he's commanding those of us who have put on Christ to keep putting on Christ. So when he gives the command to believers, he's not any longer referring just to justification. That's the moment we were saying. Now he's talking to us about sanctification. Living more holy lives as a result of being saved. Growing in practical holiness because God gave us positional holiness the day we came to Jesus Christ. So in Colossians 3 that Amanda read for us, I think you see both aspects in the putting on. Colossians 3, 9. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. This is conversion. This is salvation. Put off the old self, put on the new. But then he goes to sanctification. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. As it goes on there, you see, that's what we put on daily, is the characteristics of Jesus Christ within us. These Christian virtues come from the Holy Spirit indwelling us and now him conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ daily, regularly, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. So church, you have some new clothes. You have put on some new clothes. Positionally you became holy in Christ when you were saved. Now practically keep putting on those new clothes daily. Don't go back to those old clothes of sin, those old clothes of rebellion against God. Keep putting on those new clothes of the character of Jesus Christ being formed in you. Live that out in this dark world that we live. Augustine wrote the city of God and basically saying ever since the beginning there have been two cities, the city of God and the city of man. And they've been intertwined in the world in which we live. But members of the city of God live in the city of man now and there's salt and light in it, but one day there's only going to be the city of God. One day there will only be the kingdom of God. When the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of our God. And he says, so since that's a reality, live like that now. So what does it mean, verse 11, wake up. It's time to take off the sleeping clothes. Time to take off the pajamas. If this next sentence offends you, I'm kind of sorry. But if you're going to go to Walmart or Safeway or Fry's, maybe don't wear the pajamas. Amen. Okay? Put on a pair of jeans. Put on a t-shirt. Something. Go on out in public. Wear the proper clothes. Don't wear your sleeping clothes. And I think what Paul is saying to us here, 
Stop wearing those old clothes. Stop being asleep. Put on Christ. Dress properly. John MacArthur says that the image we found here of darkness and light, day and night, is referring to, as he talked about, put on the armor of light, put on Jesus Christ. He's saying this is the language of a soldier. And maybe the soldier has had the clothes of, he say he's going out for the night, and he's had the clothes of partying and debauchery and, and, and rebellion. He's wore those clothes, but the day has come. And it's, he's still got those clothes on. But the battle is near. He doesn't need to keep wearing those clothes. And he's put on his armor. Because he's going to go into battle. He has to have the right clothing, the right armor to go into it. So spiritually, we take away the same thing. Christian life is not a playground. It's a battleground. We've thrown off the works of darkness. we put on Jesus Christ at conversion. So keep putting him on. What does it mean to put on Christ? Put on the armor of light. We're putting on Christ's holiness daily. We're putting on His virtues. The day is drawing near. Don't live like people of the night. Live as people of the light. Church, there's a couple of things to take away. If you're in Christ, put Him on daily. And pray for the pagans. Pray for people who are like Augustine, who maybe they're waking up hungover right now. Maybe they spent last night getting high. Maybe right now they're living a homosexual lifestyle. God still saves sinners like that. This past week, I watched the 30 for 30 documentary on the nature boy, Ric Flair. Maybe some of you remember this former wrestler, this WWE wrestler, had all the, this big promotion, one of the biggest guys in wrestling through the 80s and 90s and even 2000s, and he's probably, I don't know, 70 years old now, and he was, he, he, it was, it was, I posted some about it, it's a, a tragic example of gratifying every fleshly desire you have. This is a guy who was bragging about every day for most of his adult life, he's drunk about 10 beers and 5 other alcoholic drinks every day. This is a guy who said in the course of his life he slept with 10,000 women. And many men probably idolized this guy back in those days. But what I didn't see, I didn't see a hero. I saw this tragic figure, a guy who was left empty and miserable because he pursued a life of sin. So, all that sin that promised so much joy and happiness... All it brought was misery and emptiness. So my challenge to you today, if you come in here without Christ, is don't be Ric Flair. Be Augustine. Two guys, very sinful, very much sin-obsessed, but one saw the beauty and glory of following Jesus Christ. The other has not yet. Doesn't mean he can't, doesn't mean he won't. But if he continues in that state, what sin didn't deliver upon its promises in this life certainly will not deliver in the next. So church, if you have been rescued, if you have put on Christ, keep putting on Christ daily. We're going to sing a song of reflection and invitation in just a moment. Let me pray with you as they come to sing. Father, thank you for saving a pagan like Augustine and him becoming one of the most influential men in Christian history. Thank you, Father, that you save people far, far away from you. Lord, we pray that you will use our church to reach out to people like Augustine in a, a sex-crazed culture, in a self-pleasing type culture. May we bring the good news of Jesus Christ that rescues from all that sin and the resulting emptiness and misery that it brings. And Father, for your church, for people here gathered who have put on Christ, Lord, that maybe we've gotten a little bit spiritually sleepy in the mundane, routine, everyday aspects of our lives. God, may we be encouraged through your word to put on Jesus Christ daily to live for Him in every aspect of our lives, to be transformed by the gospel and our mind renewed daily in Jesus. May we be salt and light in this world, living in this world but not of it, but sharing the good news of Christ in it. 
In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Let's stand and sing, church.